We are back for week two of our new series, Life to the Fullest. It's so good to have you here. I wanna welcome each and every one of you. I'm Mark Krenz, I'm the pastor here, and uh, one of the pastors here, and so glad to have you here. Those of you joining online as well, always great to have you connecting with, with us. As Kyle said, there are so many great things that are happening right now at Meadow Park. Before I get in the message, I just wanna say how awesome it is to be a part of what's going on. And, and uh, as Kyle mentioned, there's the, the kids have been moving up in their grades and ages, but we've also relocated our park kids' area Area to the second floor. Some of you don't even know that we have a second floor. We have a second floor, and uh, it's great to have these designated spaces for our kids, and the rooms are looking great, and they, this, the, the team has worked so hard to put that together. They launch for the student ministries tonight at 6 o'clock. I'm excited to be a part of that. I'm representing them today here with our Meadow MPC youth. Youth. Apparently, we don't use vowels anymore, but it's uh, but it's good. It's going to be there tonight. So lots of good things happening. Also, want to let you know that uh, we have appointed and asked uh, my wife Shannon Krenz to be the interim youth director. And so, in the time as we are trying to, yes, thank her for for that. Um, as we begin to make decisions about what's next for the student ministry, we're stepping in in that way, and Shannon has taken point on that. Has a lot of experience working with our students, and so I'm just so grateful for her in that role, and uh, we're gonna have a great kickoff tonight. So lots of good things happening. Man, we had a, we had a barbecue, a picnic at our house last night for the 45s. That's our fourth and fifth grade uh, kids and families last night, and so they're getting rolling. So anyway, lots of things are kicking up here for the fall, as, we, as, as Kyle mentioned, all these different opportunities. And uh, we're also rolling out this new disciple path. That's what this uh, series uh, helps us understand. What does it mean to be on this disciple's journey? What does it look like when Jesus says he's come to give us life to the fullest, and yet we kind of go, yeah, our life is full, but it's unfulfilling. We might have it so packed full, so much going on. Well, how can we really experience life to the fullest? Is it really possible that we could say as believers, and I ask myself that question too, when my life gets heavy and full and I start feeling like Ah, oh, there's too much going on. I'm going, God, is this how you created it for us? Is this how you designed us? Or am I putting energy and attention into things that really aren't maybe your priorities? And so how do we get back to these pieces that say this is how we experience life to the fullest? And that's what we've been looking at or what we're gonna be looking at throughout this series. And I began to introduce that to us last week. And, and this idea of, of these three areas, these core longings that we have, that are in each of us, this longing to belong, to believe, and to become. We didn't have the, the screen last week, and so if you show up, I think we have these, the circles here, this graphic, and I don't know what order that's in. Is, is it up, or we have that? There it is, yeah. So this idea of these three pieces together, belonging, believing, and becoming, this belonging of life together, spiritual vitality, and then living that out, love and action. All these three things need to happen in our lives simultaneously in a way that we begin to experience what it means to live a Christ-centered life to experience what Jesus said is life to the fullest. So we're gonna be looking at these over the next couple of weeks. What does it mean to belong, to believe, and to become, and how we meet those core uh, longings that are in our souls. And we followed the, the journey of Peter a little bit last week. Peter, uh, one of you know, the most well-known disciples of Jesus, and how he experienced each of these in his life, how Jesus invited him into this relationship of belonging. Come and follow me. Come on this journey. And Jesus began to invest in his life for years, just spending time together on this journey. Till Peter came to that point of saying, you are the Messiah. He came to this recognition, this awareness of who Jesus is, <clears throat> excuse me, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And his faith began to, to be put in him and his trust was put in him. And then after the resurrection, Peter became the, the, the leader of the church, the leader of the new community, and, and living out this faith and dying for it himself. We see these things happening, belonging, believing, and becoming together to form that foundation. And so what I wanna talk about today, though, I wanna dive deeper into this belonging piece. What does it mean to belong? So today in part two, belong, I am known and loved. When we belong, we come to a place where we are known and loved, where we can just find that sense of connection, of community, of peace. Do you feel like you belong? I mean, it really gets at these core questions. Remember, I addressed them last week. The core questions, do I fit in anywhere? What am I here for? Who, who do I connect with? Am I lovable? Am I, can I be loved? Is there anyone that will accept me? These are core belonging questions. But here's the, the problem. America has been called the loneliest nation on earth. Does that surprise you? America is one of the loneliest nations on earth. People would say they are lonely. Over 60% of people describe feeling lonely at some point in, in, in the last year when, the, when surveyed. 22% would describe being lonely often or always. 
So like, you know, social psychologists, was they're looking at what it means, what loneliness is, it's, it's this, this gap between this desired level of connection and relationship and what we actually experience. So in our minds, we see people or we're watching others and we go, man, if we could connect with, as a family like that, or I see how others have these friendship circles and they're out at restaurants together or they're at an event or they vacation together or maybe they just seem to have these deep friends that they connect with regularly. I want that, but I don't have it. And this gap of like not having this full connection that we long for leaves us feeling empty, leaves us feeling lonely. And so we experience that gap between what we want and, and, and what we actually experience. So I read, found this article that, that I read in, uh, in, in Harvard Magazine, and, and one of the professors there, Jeremy Nickel, he's, uh, he teaches at the School of Public Health. Uh, he teaches a course on loneliness. So you can actually take a course at Harvard on, on loneliness. And what he said is the, the, one of these areas of loneliness is existential, uh, existential loneliness, this existentialism of where do I um, fit in? And these were the questions we were talking about last week. Do I fit in the universe, he says. That's the question that people are asking. Does my life have any meaning, purpose, weight, mission? And you know who say, he says these questions are particularly important to? It's 18 to 24 year olds. These existential questions of where do I belong, where do I fit in? Speaking of America as being lonely, do you know what group of Americans is the loneliest uh, age segment? You might think senior citizens. You might think, man, you know, friends have, have passed away. We've had several funerals here in the church. Somebody this morning said half of my Sunday school classes is passing away. And that's hard and that's difficult and maybe feeling that isolation. But you know what? You know who says they're the loneliest? The loneliest group? 18 to 24-year-olds. You go, why? I mean, everyone has a smartphone. I mean, they're constantly texting. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's communications. They're sharing videos and snaps. There's loneliness, there's not a deeper sense of connection, relationship, it's, it's being the, the virtual relationships, though they have value and they have a place, they are not meeting and fulfilling sometimes that deeper need that's, that's being longed for. And so we experience loneliness and, and the problem of loneliness, it also has a very serious physical effects. Doctors are saying in this article, they were saying that, that loneliness, if you experience it, is, is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being an alcoholic has the same kind of physical effects as, as being lonely. So it has this impact on us. And then maybe we say, okay, well this is why we have the church. We come together and we're together and we're in this place and some of us, the reality is some of you may be coming every week, you might be sitting here this morning and you may be experiencing loneliness. You can be around other people, you can be in a place where you're, you're here and you see others and yet you can still be lonely. And sometimes people come into church and there's an excitement, we're getting new to a church, getting connected, we're, we wanna be a part of this, and then after a while it's like, do I know anybody? Does anybody know me? And can the church be just the same as maybe in other places where people form their groups and don't allow somebody else in and it's hard to kind of break into that environment? Should the church be like that? I'm gonna ask you that, should the church be like that? <laughs> Are we sometimes like that? We're human, we're people, it's not good, we need to work on that. So, so where do we find that belonging? How do we do that? So I wanna talk about that. What does that look like to, to belong? How did God design that for us and how do we experience it? So let's jump into that. Um, I'm gonna look at scripture in, in, in broad strokes here to kinda give us a perspective. Belonging is hardwired into us. If you go back to Genesis at the very beginning of scripture, what does God say after he creates man? It is not good for man to be what? Alone. Right? It's not good for man to be alone, so he created, whoa, man, right? And put <laughs> them together. But this idea of creating this, this foundation, of being, this, this, this family, being in connection. But he also says, he also said, uh, God also said, let us create man in our own image. What does that mean? Does it mean that God looks like us, that we picture, you know, the gray hair, the gray beard, and, and, and we, I don't know. We don't know what God looks like. And, and some have meant that to be, it's, he looks like us, or we look like God. But could it be that the image of God is to be in relationship? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That when, they were, when man was made in his image, it was to be in relationship, to not be alone. So God created man, put him in a family unit, put him as husband and wife, as man and woman together to create that foundation, put us into community, into families. And then the whole Old Testament follows the story of one nation, the nation of Israel, the people of God, the Hebrews, that God would, would show them. He said, I will bless you and make you a blessing to other nations. And so much of the Old Testament is how do people get along with one another? 
How do people who follow God learn to interact with one another? Because wherever there are two people, there is a problem at some point. There is conflict, there is challenge. And so the church is not immune from that. People are not immune from that. Families are not immune from that. The whole Old Testament is about dealing with you know, all these Old Testament laws and it's about how to relate with one another, how to connect with God, how to relate with the outsider. But this was this idea of being a nation, God placing people into community, into people, into tribes, into families. But then when you flip the pages of the, of the Bible and you get to the New Testament, we have the greatest, most powerful, the biggest example of God's vote for the importance of belonging. Jesus came. We turn the pages and here is the Son of God born, stepping out of heaven and into earth. We read about it in John chapter one, verse 14. John says it in, in more poetic language, talking about the word of God that existed, this, this, this God that existed in all eternity. He says, the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Think about it. The God of heaven stepped down into earth and became one of us. The message paraphrase says it this way, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I mean, isn't that awesome? The God of all eternity didn't say, you know what, you guys should belong, connect. He said, I am going to physically come and be present among my people. I'm gonna show you what it looks like to step out and to step into humility and to become God among us. He had to get close, he had to get personal. Love gets close, love touches, love gets in proximity. Love gives of itself, and so Jesus modeled that. Jesus showed that, that this is how important it is for us to be in relationship with him, with others. But again, he didn't just come and say, this is who I am, now you know who I am. What's one of the first things he did? We talked about it last week. He said, come, follow me. Immediately, he draws people together. He, he formed a group of disciples, the, the 12 that were close to him. I mean, think about that. Instantly inviting others, let's be part of relationship, part of community. And it wasn't just come meet me once, once a week for an hour and I'm gonna teach you something from the word of God. Let's do life together. Let's walk together, let's eat together, let's, let's discuss together, let's struggle together, let's experience some awesome things together. And it was this life on life journey that Jesus modeled with his disciples. But he didn't just say it's just the 12 of us, I'm pouring into them. Jesus had this way of, of inviting and drawing others into relationship. He was a friend of sinners, the Bible says. He was a friend of those who, who rejected him or, or, and people that were rejected by others. He came close to the lepers, he came close to the sick, he came close to the needy, and they found connection, and the crowds followed him. They were drawn, and there's something about Jesus that met that core need of belonging. And not just in a spiritual way, but in a very real, social, interpersonal way that, that community was there to be had. And so we see it modeled in Jesus, and, and in the end, it wasn't just be in relationship, let's hang out together. What did Jesus do? He gave up his life. He gave up his life for us so that we could have life in eternity. He says he's going to prepare a place for us, that he wants us to be with him where he is, that this idea of connection, community, togetherness is so hardwired into us and modeled by Christ himself. When Jesus went into heaven, he said, stay here and I'm gonna give you another, I'm gonna give you a helper, the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Jesus said, stay here, and I'm gonna be with you always. How? Through his Holy Spirit. So Christ's presence continues, and, and it was the formation of the church. And very soon after Jesus ascended, the believers were, were getting together, or people were getting together, and, and they were all gathered in Jerusalem. And Peter is preaching, and it says 3,000 came to know Christ that day. They gave their lives to him, they were baptized. They were transformed by what Jesus did. And here's what we read in Acts chapter two. Follow along with me in this preeminent passage of the church in the early church, this picture that we get. It says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So just stop there, 3,000 in one day. They were like, good, I'm in, I got my ticket to heaven. We'll see you later, Peter, see you later, everybody. I'm gonna go live my life now, I'm good to go. No, they realized the guy we're following, the one who we just gave our life to, not just some guy, the Lord of of lords, the king of kings, the one who's our savior, Jesus Christ, he was just executed. And if we're gonna follow him, we gotta, what does this mean? I mean, they're, they're living in a hostile environment, are they not? <laughs> I mean, they know what just happened. Here they are forming this community. So what did they do? All the believers devoted themselves, it says in verse 42, to the apostles' teaching. We gotta know what to do with this. 
The apostles, the ones who've been with Jesus all along, help us understand what does it mean to now live as a follower of Christ. I'm devoted to this time together to spend learning about this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Fellowship and sharing meals. You know, churches always used to have what was called a fellowship hall, right? That's one thing we excelled at as a church, fellowshipping, a word that we don't maybe use as much out in society anymore, but to be together, to be in proximity with one another, to hang out together, to share meals together. I mean, that's potluck right there happening, right from the beginning. Church potlucks at its best, sharing meals. Because what happens is when you're having meals, when you're connecting, you're building relationship. You're forming community. And then they broke bread together, the Lord's Supper. Why is that so important? Because it wasn't just some random gathering, it was Christ in the middle. A reminder that we are connected because of Christ's broken body for us. We each take a part and we share that meal together. We do that once a month here at Meadow Park, at least on, on the first Sunday of the month typically. A reminder that we are the body of Christ together. And to prayer. There was a component understanding that, that Christ is present. It's not just us having a conversation, but we invite God's presence. We pray for one another. And so this is how the community formed. And then it says, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And then this is so interesting to me, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. We gotta start getting together. We gotta start sharing what we have. Mi casa es su casa. My stuff is your stuff. My lawnmower is your lawnmower. I mean, we're, we're sharing whatever we have together. And then it, it continues. They worship together at the temple. Uh, I skipped the verse. They sold their property. This is huge. And possessions and shared the money with those in need. I think they were pretty serious about this, don't you? That's a whole different level of commitment saying like, all right, I'm gonna sell my property and you've got some need. I'm gonna do that. They worshiped together at the temple once a week, once a month, or whenever it was convenient. Oh, wait, each day, sorry. Every day. Every day. Then they met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You see this picture They've come to to, to follow Christ. They've seen who he is and what he's done for them, the forgiveness. Now they're like, how do I live this out? Well, I gotta get together with others who are experiencing this too, and we gotta learn what it means. We gotta devote ourselves to the teaching. We gotta care for one another. We gotta look out for one another. There's a hostile world out there that that isn't in favor of what we're doing here. They, they, They executed Jesus, but yet we're committed to this. We're gonna care for one another. We're gonna pray. And what did God do? He added to their number daily those who were being saved. The community grew, the fellowship grew as they were gathering in different places and people realized I'm part of a community that is bigger than me. And then we read in the rest of the New Testament all these different letters that are, that are written to help the church learn how to be the church, to help the people of God learn what, it mean, what does it mean to be the family of God? How do you deal with conflict and challenges and faith and how do you deal with the outsiders and reaching out to others and sharing your faith? It's the community coming together, belonging as one. And you follow this through, like we said, from, the, from, from creation, through the Old Testament, through Jesus' incarnation, through the church. You get the idea that God cares about us being in community with one another, don't you? That this is a big deal. You can say it this way, following Jesus was never designed to be a solitary journey. So many of us think it's a, we talk about a personal relationship with Christ, and while I think that's a valid way to talk about it, we forget about the corporate relationship with Christ, the community relationship with Christ. When we're so heavy on the personal relationship with Christ, we forget that I was never meant to just walk this journey alone. It was meant to be in a family, to be connected to the church itself. And so here we, here we go. This is the church. This is about being the church. It's about being together. It's about being in this place connecting with one another on this disciple's journey together. We have to belong. This is not about you sitting at home, reading your Bible in isolation, never connecting with the church, going, I've got my faith. I don't need to be part of a body. I mean, come on, I'm saved. I don't need the church. Let me ask you a question. Can you be a Christian without being part of a church? I'll grant you it's a, somewhat of a trick question because you can start getting all, you know, start talking theology. Well, is, does the church save you or does it not? I don't think you can, though. 
I don't think you can. That's not how God designed it to be. For you to say, uh, you know, now if you're like, you know, stranded on a deserted aisle and nobody can rescue you and you're by yourself, you know, forget those silly arguments. God designed us to be part of a family, the church. So we ask ourselves this question, what makes the belonging in the church different than belonging anywhere else? Or what makes belonging at church different than other belonging elsewhere? Because you can belong in other places, right? I mean, are there, do, are there places where you can meet regularly with other people? Sure, you can be part of a club, a group, a team. Is caring unique, caring for one another unique to the church? There's people that care for each other. There's families, there's groups, you know, at work, maybe somebody has something going on and you do a Kickstarter campaign and you care for each other. Well, is that unique to the church? What's unique to the church? It's that we are a Christ-centered community. Christ. That's the difference. And that changes everything. It changes everything about the way we relate to each other, how we connect with one another, what we do, how we care. And how God puts this church together, he says, we are adopted into a new family. You know, you, you can't choose your family, right? Some of us, you know, we wouldn't choose relationship with each other, but God brought us together in this place. Because it's not our economics that put us in the same place, it's not our education, it's not race, it's not gender, it's that we all come hungry and humble at the foot of the cross. That's the difference, we start at that point, we start by saying it is because the difference Christ has made in our lives, we begin at that point and that changes everything about the way we are to relate with one another. It doesn't mean we don't have problems, it doesn't mean we, don't dis you know, we disagree, it doesn't mean we, we, you know, it's always just smiles and giggles. Life can be hard in, in community, but it is a Christ-centered community that God has called us to. Galatians 3.28 says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's such a uniqueness about this body that is the church, and we are in a local expression of a, the larger church, right? The big C church, as it's sometimes called, globally. Christians everywhere today, 24 hours a day, worshiping, gathering in homes, in churches, under trees, in alleys, wherever they are, it is the church. And we are here, Meadow Park, a local expression of this body of Christ. And we are to be a welcoming, belonging community that allows anyone to be a part of that. So I want to transition here for a little bit. How do you become part of a community and experience it? I want to talk about three commitments to experience belonging. Three commitments. And this is going to help you not just here in the church, although I'm going to gear it towards the church, but in any, in, in any setting. These are three commitments that will change the way that you experience belonging. These are three commitments that will change the way that you connect to others. This is... A commitment, these are commitments that'll help you kick loneliness and isolation to the curb. What are the three commitments? We'll talk about these here. Show up, open up, and give up. Show up, open up, and give up. Let me talk about what I mean by each of these. First one, I will show up. Your presence matters. Your presence matters. Do you know that it matters that you're here today? It matters. You might think, you know, it didn't matter if I show up, you know, nobody cares, what does it make a difference? It matters that you're watching online, that you're saying, I'm there. Some of you have told me, uh, I talked with someone, someone first time here today in a long time, but you know, I'm watching all the time. I've been watching for the past year. I'm there every week. Your presence matters. Woody Allen once said, 80% of success is just showing up. Just showing up, right? You come to church, that you get together, that's already the first part of success. That's the first way in which you're gonna break the isolation and the loneliness is you're saying, I am going to show up. But the irony is, the more lonely you are, the more the hurdle comes to actually get together, to get with others, right? Like, I'm lonely, but ah, all the excuses, why I don't wanna get together. Nobody, I don't know anybody. We hear it all the time, or maybe you think like, you know, kid, you remember like sending kids to camp, or maybe you felt this way, it's like, but I don't know anyone, I don't wanna go. Well, okay, I guess you still won't know anybody if you don't go, but what happens if you go to a week of camp? You come home, and I think it's called friends, right? What happened is you had to show up. I don't wanna go to youth tonight because I don't know anybody, or I don't wanna go to this event, I don't wanna start joining a small group because I don't know anybody. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's why, but you have to take that first step. You have to show up. You have to take a step. You have to actually get out there and do that. And we look at you know, the church and you say, well, does it, let's talk about attendance for a little bit. Why does it matter? Why does it matter how many are here, who's here? I mean, 
If it's just a number, sure, that doesn't matter. Is it all about pastors' egos? Is it about what we, what, what we can report? You know why it matters to me? Because your presence is the greatest sign of your commitment. Right? If somebody shows up, they have to make an effort to be there. They have to take a step to, to, to choose this time, to choose to care, to choose to be in a relationship, to choose to value the thing that we're, that we're committing to together. Your presence matters. Because it shows what more than time, I mean your time, more than money, more than anything else is, is precious and what you do with it and how you choose to spend it is very important and communicates a lot. As we read in Acts 2, the believers devoted themselves. It wasn't just a haphazard like, eh, we'll see. They devoted themselves to the disciples preaching and teaching. I saw a post this week about Christians in Afghanistan versus Christians in America today. We need to be praying for Afghanistan. You know what showing up means for them? It could mean death. And as Christians there that are, going to be, that are worshiping today, don't, they don't know if they're going to be beheaded or shot. And the post kind of was saying, well, Christians in America, I'll go to church depending on what's on the Gulf Channel. I'll go to church if I'm not too tired. I'll show up if I have nothing better to do, if there's not a basketball game or a soccer tournament or a birthday party. I wanna challenge you with this commit, show up challenge here. You can count on me being there every week. Why is this so hard for us? I mean, it might be speaking to the wrong folks here. You guys are joining in. But wh why is this such a hard commitment? It's amazing to me. Honestly, I'll have conversations and I'll ask people for different things and are you gonna be there, are you gonna show up? Well, I don't know, we'll see. We all love to say we'll see, why? Because some, In case something else happens, in case something else shows up, if this is the commitment we've made, if this is what the body of believers does, we gather on the first day of the week to put Christ first and front and center, why are we making this decision on Sunday morning while we're in bed to, to see if we want to be a part of the church? This is, this is the reality. What would it take for you to say, I will be there every week? Granted, you're gonna be sick some week. I know you're gonna travel. Something's gonna happen, but you know what I'm talking about. This is my commitment. I'm a part of the body of Christ. When you show up, that belonging commitment makes the biggest difference in the church, in others. I was in this room preaching when we were during COVID lockdown and just speaking to a camera. It's different. It's different, right, when there's people around. Those of you watching online, if you've been in, in worship in person versus watching it online, is it the same or is it different? Those of you who've done that, is it the same or is it different? It's different. It's not saying it's bad, I'm glad for the technology, I'm glad that we have the ability during this time too to do that, but there's something about being in the room, being present, that matters if you're here. Belonging matters, showing up matters. Make the commitment every week, I will show up. Second commitment, I will open up. Share your life. This is where it gets a little more like, oh. <laughs> Showing up is one thing. Opening up, that's a whole other thing. Some of the men here going, uh, count me out. You know, I don't want to open up. That's wimpy. I don't know, whatever, you know, I don't want to open up. <laughs> but we've talked about here in, about moving from rows to circles. Moving from rows to circles. It's great to be in this place. There is a belonging sense. We're connecting. Say hi to your neighbor, you know, greet one another and have some conversations. But let me ask you, in your house, what is the configuration of the couches in your living room? What about your dining room table? I don't know what has those anymore. How about your kitchen table? <laughs> what about your patio furniture? It's in circles or arches, or rows, why? Because we wanna face each other, we wanna spend time, we wanna interact with one another. We need to move from the rows into a, a setting of circles, and the way we do that is, is, in, our, is, is in groups. It's to connect it with a smaller number of people. Did you know that Jesus was in a small group? <laughs> right? Jesus was in a small group, it's called the disciples, it was his 12, he connected with them all the time. He was in a small group, and at, at Meadow Park, we're rebranding what we call our small groups from community groups to life groups. Does that change anything about them? Not necessarily, but it's a name that really reflects what we want to communicate. If our mission is to experience life to the fullest in Christ, one of the ways we do that through belonging is to be connected in a community, to be in a circle, to connect life on life with others, to experience belonging, believing, and becoming. And so these are groups, these are times where we're to experience life. 
a place where you can have a dialogue, where you can have a conversation, where you can talk about the message or the scripture. You can pray for one another. Ask how things are going. Challenge each other. Whatever the struggles are, you spend life together, but it takes time to open up to one another. To sit there and actually now say, it's not just I can hide behind a crowd, but I'm gonna get vulnerable. And that scares many of us away, and we wonder why nobody knows us. It's because, again, the same dilemma of even showing up is, am I willing to risk something in order to experience something? Look what it says in Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. There's a different level of community and connection and sharing when it's about sharing our own lives. Not just staying up here and, and you know, let's just talk Bible and scripture and that's as important as that is, but now it's our life. This is where faith is lived out every day. And so we need to be in a place where we can share our life together. That's what the early church did. Look at Romans 12, 15 to 16. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Don't be that know-it-all in your small group. <laughs> no, but this idea of weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice, that's the awesome thing you get to do in community. I don't know right now today if this, today's your birthday or if you had something great going on, this isn't the place where we can celebrate that in that same way, but you get in that small group or you were in that, that Sunday school class this morning and, and you got to say, today's my birthday. Yesterday we had a 45 cookout at our house and one of the kids, Logan, it was his 10th birthday. It was like, oh, it's your birthday, happy birthday, right? We, I didn't, wouldn't have gotten to know that in a larger setting. But somebody else, you sit down and you have a conversation and it's, man, I'm just, I'm experiencing a lot of loss right now. There's things that are really challenging we open up, we begin to share, and things begin to change when we, when we open our lives up in that way to one another. I will show up, I will open up, and third, I will give up. What do I mean by that? Giving up, sacrifice, love, and resources. Not give up as in quit. Give up as it's gonna cost us something. True community costs us something. It really does. I mean, it, it, it costs us something. If you want to experience true community, you have to invest in it. It costs Jesus his life for us. He so much loved us that he gave up his life for us to be in relationship with us, that we can have that. It cost him his life, and so is it gonna cost us something? Yes. We talked about time, right? Showing up. Energy. <laughs> Opening up. Who you are, being, being vulnerable, risking some of those pieces and money and resources. It's gonna cost us something. There's an investment there. What did the early church do? They sold their possessions. They gave to those in need. There was a financial investment into their community. You know, Kyle was mentioning here, you know, the thank you for the giving and for the, that we do, whether it's online or whether you give in the boxes. We talk about tithing and giving. That's because we support this family. We don't sell a product. We don't bill anybody. We don't charge anybody anything. It's all just done out of love and out of the generosity of the people that call this church home. You'd be blown away by the generosity of some people here, and you would be utterly shocked at the non-generosity of some people here. Getting a little close, aren't I? You don't like that, pastor shouldn't talk about money. Bible talks about money. Bible talks about things. The lights wouldn't stay on if it wasn't for the generosity of people. The mission wouldn't continue if it wasn't for the generosity that says, I believe in this community. I wanna support one another. I wanna do these things that help us as a body to do the mission that God has called us on, and I'm gonna help out those that are in need. It's a beautiful picture when we see the generosity, and we see it over and over and over and over again over the years here, and, and it's so cool to be around that. So you might be asking, why should I show up, open up, and give up? A phrase that I like to say a lot is, you never realize how much you need community until you need community. You never realize how much you need help until you need help. You never realize how much you need support until you need support. See, we think we can go, when life is good and everything's going fine, it doesn't feel like we need others and things we can do it on our own, but what I see all the time as a pastor is when the crisis hits, when the struggle lands, then where's the church? Where are the people? And you've not invested in relationship. You've not invested in those pieces, and, and, and that's what, what community does. I mean, the church will still show up and do what we can, but you know what's more powerful is when you've been there, because when you show up, others will show up for you. 
others will open up for you and others will give up and sacrifice for you as well. And that's the beauty of relationship, beauty of community. We give towards one another. We invest in one another. We show up, we open up, we give up. So let me just now get, uh, show you how we talk about this here at Meadow Park as, uh, and maybe where you're at in your journey of, of connecting here at the church. We got this little, little graphic here of um, this little arrow as a process in, in belonging. We've got some scriptures there. We've looked at a couple of them. You can look at some of those on, on your own as well. But even when we talk about this, 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 this idea of belonging, we start with this new here. It's important. Why do we welcome guests every single week? Why do we want to make that connection? Because at some point, we want to know your name. We want to know who you are. We want to build a relationship. It starts by knowing someone. And then we want to take that further. Next Sunday, right, meet the pastors. We want to meet you. We want to help get you oriented. And we're starting a process of three classes that are going to start in, um, in September, Belong, Believe, and Become, where we look at deeper at how these, places, these pieces play out in our church to help that happen. Because we know anchoring into the community starts somewhere. You have to get to know the community, get to know some people. Your name needs to be known. And then you talk about connection events. We had the corn, the, the corn roast the other night, right? We have church picnics. We have some gatherings. Why do we wear name tags? You know, we want to connect. There's a place to go beyond the rows and to start building relationships fellowshipping, community, building together. But ultimately, we wanna also lead into life groups. Are you connected in a place where you are known and can share life with, with five to 10 to 12 people, whatever that number is, a smaller group, where you're getting together, whether it's every week or every other week? We've got all kinds of groups in the church. We'd love to launch even more groups if you wanna help community happen, to create that place where people connect. But God's mission wasn't just for that we would be in a small group forever and always or that that's the culmination of it. That's just the catalyst to begin life and relationships outside of that meeting. And we look at that bottom part in daily life, I'm showing Christ's love and building bridges to the people around me. You experience belonging, but then you live that out. You become like Christ in building bridges to people and, and inviting others and letting them know they're loved and they're welcome in your home, in your street, in your circle of friends, you're inviting them to church, or maybe into your group. That's the way that community happens. And so this is a, one of the processes as we're talking about how to help the journey of the disciple. Maybe you're somewhere along this path. Maybe you're brand new to the church here, and we wanna say we wanna get to know you. We wanna help build that relationship, connect you in places where you can build those deeper relationships. Or maybe you're saying, I don't even know Christ. I'm not even sure about the church or anything. You are welcome here. We know that belonging typically happens before believing that you're in a place where you can ask questions, where you can bring your doubts, where you can have your uncertainties and say, you know what, that's okay. Let's, let's walk through that. Let's talk through that. And watch what God does in your life. We wanna walk on that journey with you. So, where are you? How would you describe where you are in your belonging? Are you lonely? Jesus Christ came and gave his life for you to build that relationship, but then to put you into the church, to put you in a community. Have you been standoffish maybe with community? Maybe it's a time to say, I'm gonna lean into it. I'm gonna take a chance. I'm gonna take a risk. I'm gonna get into a group. I'm gonna find a place where I can connect, where I can show up, where I can open up, where I'm willing to give up to be a part of what God has called me to do to meet those fundamental belonging needs. It's a powerful thing when we see the church come together. It was so fun last night. We were at the, you know, just had again about 30 plus, 30, 40 people at our house. And we're all outside and watching kids running and playing and then a group forms a circle and, and sitting in their camping chairs and we're eating hamburgers and we're having conversation and, and I discover things that you don't discover when you just sit in a row. I discovered that Jason Yaki used to ride his, uh, his bike in a velodrome when he was up to 10 years old. You know, those like angled bank things and did you know that those bikes don't have different gears? Like I learned all kinds of stuff. Now, was that a deeply spiritual conversation? No, but I feel like I know Jason better because I had some time with him. And did you know that Erin Neely, that she went on a vacation when she was younger with her family out to Seattle and they had a conversion van that we were all jealous of and then they were towing this pop-up camper and this pop-up camper, when, when, when her dad took this one turn too tight, it actually, the camper broke the, uh, half the, the bumper off. It was kind of hanging there and that was really embarrassing but then later they made another turn and the bumper got pushed back onto the car and it was, it was good again. You don't get that stuff here on a Sunday morning. But that's where sharing life and sharing community. But if those relationships develop over time and you meet consistently, you start talking about what about faith? 
What's going on in our lives personally? What's happening spiritually? Who are your kids? What are their names? What are they into? What are they interested in? That's the beauty of the church. That's the community that God created us for. And my desire, my hope is for each and every one of us to not just be a lone ranger in faith, to not just be a name or a face in the crowd or online, but that you're connecting with a small group of people to, to do life with and to be centered in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for a church that we can call home. But God, may it be more than a worship service to attend. God, may it be a community that we belong to because of your sacrifice for us, your investment in us, your love for us. Lord, today, if we need to take a risk and, and sacrifice some of our time and our resources, our love, our relationship, God, help us to take that step into deeper community with those around us. Father, forge us deeper as a church on the mission you've called us to. And may this be a place of deep love and acceptance. And Father, if there's anyone here today that is just feeling crushed and lonely and isolated, I just give you thanks that they're listening in, dialing in, that they're sitting here, God, to be in your presence. Father, would you fill them with your spirit, with your comfort and with your love. And Father, may that not only just be something that's personal and spiritual between you and them, but God, may we as a community surround them with love and prayer and encouragement. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.